morning, Jake. How are you? Hi. Hello. Nice to see you. Just the two of us, huh? I guess. Is my picture not on? Um, I just see a picture of Oka. Oh, you know what? I, oh, oh, you. Oh, yeah, I, I, I stopped the video. I meant to stop the recording, not the video. But anyway, I, I, can, I can edit the video later. So. Now I can see you. Let's see. I don't know who iPhone guests are. I don't know who they are. I'm about to let everybody in in a couple of minutes. How many, how many people do you have uh, waiting? Seven, it says. Oh, okay. Um, well, so you can, you can I'll set them, for tonight. You can give them my phone number. Okay. Or uh, and they can, uh, you know, my uh, uh, what two seven five six eight nine nine, and they can either text me on it or call me on it. Okay, that's what we'll do. Sounds good. All right, I'll put it on the whiteboard for a little bit, just like we did last time. But actually, the people that are in probably don't need it unless they don't know how to turn on the sa sound. Um, I will probably type it into the chat thing. That's where people usually send me the help. I don't know how to get on thing. Well, the thing is, if people can't get in, uh, they may not even get that far. You know, yeah, I know. Whiteboard, um, and they can't even get into Zoom. But I think most people by now know how to do Zoom. But there's always... <clears throat> yeah. Well, I asked everybody to figure it out ahead of time. Well, I think we're going to have a lot of people. I've already had three contacts for sales. Is Beverly joining us too tonight? Yes, but oh. uh, she'll be on her computer so that in case I have to handle a call, I, you know, I won't screw oh, up. Oh, that's good. Yeah, Bob's going to be on his too. So, okay. Um, well, we're just going to wait a few minutes. What else? Um, I've learned a little more about how to share. I'm going to let Evelyn show her PowerPoint herself instead of me showing it. And so I learned about share to all participants and stop sharing. So that was a good thing to learn. So okay. we practiced today and we did it right. So, okay. <laughs> so okay. Oh, gosh, that should be up. three minutes. What, two minutes? I don't see Jeff. Oh, let me see. I wish I could see the names of everybody. Oh, I can if I scroll down. Let me see. I'm going to scroll down. I don't want to admit all. I just want to admit, oh, here comes Jeff, Evelyn. I don't know who's on the iPhone. I don't know who that is. Chris yeah, some people don't put their name. They just Randy, go to whatever. I don't recognize that person here. Okay, there's Jeff Lowe. Annie. Yeah, um, they don't put their name on it. Any guess? I don't know who the iPhone is. Hey, hi. Trying to let in people I recognize to start with. Hi, how is everybody? So glad you could make it. So we're about to recognize uh, iPhone, you can change their name. It just, yeah, it just says iPhone. I don't know who it is. So um, I'll just wait a minute. Here's Bev. All right. A few people. I've already had um, interest in sales. Three different buyers have been juggling back and forth between the email. Uh, so Hila said she'll handle sales tonight. So uh, I could. That's good. Uh, cool. cool. Yeah. That's good. Somebody has two devices on. Yeah. Don't don't have a, a phone and a computer on. It won't work. Or maybe Evelyn and Jeff are sitting too close together. <laughs> uh, well, are we about ready? Should I let people in? It's time, huh? Yep. All right. I don't see any more artists. Where's our artists? I've been talking to Jeff Gillette and Lori all day. Okay, we'll just admit all who was waiting there. Okay, here we go. There we go. There's a few. I just saw one of Lori's sculptures somewhere. Hey, there's uh, Eric. Hi, Lori. Hi, how are you? Oh, we get to see Lori's studio. Cool. <laughs> all right. Whoops. But accidentally mute everybody. Is everybody muted? I'm unmuted. Should I be muted? Um, no. Um, I, I say yes. Yeah, we will. Hi, Jeff. We will mute every everybody until you know when there's one speaker. Right now, it's just a free for all. So, <laughs> yes. but we probably should mute. Just waiting. I'm gonna admit all these people that are waiting right now. So. Got some sun issues here. Oh, we'll hold this right now. 
so Hill is going to handle online sales tonight. We've had quite a few people interested, so um, she'll handle that. So let's see. A couple of people need to turn on their videos. Uh, they have they have on their sound, but not their video. There's a few people. We'll have to figure out how to do that. <laughs> this is when everyone's trying to figure out whether they can be heard or not. Yeah, here comes Tom Lamb. Hi. Oh, here comes Jill. Oh, good. Hi. How are you? Very cool. Hi, I see Jill. How are you, Jill? Look at all the people. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, here comes Rob. Yay, Rob. Peter's there. Hi, Peter. Peter's somewhere. It was actually really nice at the gallery last night. It was quite nice. Lovely. So everything looks really good. Okay. No, now it says mute. Oh, but to unmute it. Okay. Does anybody need help with anything? Um, anything technical? Jake Jacobs has volunteered for technical advice. If anybody needs any. Um, I'll put his number up in just a second. So maybe I'll just do that right now. So how many people do you see on your screen right now? There are nine. Yeah. That's if you paid over. Huh? If you paid over. Oh. Mm. Oh. What did I do? What did I do? Now they're all gone. What did I do? Mm. I'm putting the whiteboard up if you just see white right now. Oh, maybe it wasn't me then. Yeah, that little square thing's gone, but there you can scan across the bottom. Well, I don't know. My whiteboard's not working. Oh, I got to put the text. Here. There we go. Oh, you're typing? Oh, she took over the screen. Ah. Technical. Oh, technical help. Did you put there? What? Did you take over technical help? Is that what you're looking at? Yeah. They may need technical help. See how they get them all back on the screen again. Trouble with your sound or trouble with your picture. I guess if you're having trouble with your picture, you're not going to. Victoria Chapman, no good. Oh, I see. Should I hit that again? Oh, there we go. Okay. Cool. Now I think I'm gone. Maybe we're too close together. Oh, this folder, right? Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. Great. I see oh, you're you. welcome. Had to be here. Who is that who's talking? Robin. Hi, it's Robin. Hi. Uh, Rob. Hi, Robin. <laughs> I see two names. Like, here comes Carolyn. Yeah. Well, I was thinking I might try to do a, do a review of this show if I could get enough information. Oh, well, you're, you're, you're going to get so much information tonight. You'll, you'll be sick of us. So. <laughs> maybe, I'll come, maybe I'll come and see it in person. Can I yeah, any time. Just shoot me an email and I'll give you a private trip. Okay, I'll do that. I would love to do that. <laughs> that would be fun. I think we'd be able to arrange it. Okay. is willing to review it, but. And a few artists too, maybe. So. Yeah. So okay. are you in charge of this, Robin? Um, yeah, I guess so. I'm moderating tonight. So. Okay, I've got some questions, but I'll just email you. Okay. Yeah, just email me. Okay. okay I'll do that. Yeah, I'm going to put uh, everybody on mute. Um, and then we'll just start. I think it's time. If people join late, I'm going to, I'll pick that up again in a couple of minutes and uh, we'll add them in there. So um, if everyone could just put themselves on mute, that's great. Uh, put yourself on mute. Well, you can't do that? Uh, put it on mute now? Yeah. Probably. Just everybody put, put yourself on mute. I don't want to. <laughs> Where's the chat? I see two messages already on the chat. Okay. How do I chat? That's a good question. You, you click on the chat, and then, then the message thing comes up on the right, and then you can type messages there. Well, my question is, how do I chat to another participant? It just comes up with your name, and I can't get anyone else's. Well, you can change names if you click. Like right now, I have Jake Jacobs on mine, and I, then if I click on it, everybody's name shows up underneath. OK. Two. Yeah. That's OK. That's OK. Yeah, so you can do it privately. So. Okay. Oh, here comes Kurt. Let me get Kurt in. Okay. All right. You almost need two people. One person to manage the people coming in and something else. I'm going to, uh, I think I'm going to get going because then I can watch the people. 
because I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. Okay, you let's see. Here we group, are. You have group um, chat turned off, Robin. I have what? You have group chat turned off so they can only, right now, chat with you. Oh, okay. Where That's is that? that? Thank I, you. There's a, there might be a little right arrow uh, on the right of the little chat button, and, and you can select. Chat. Um, to the right on, on the chat button itself, there might be a little chevron pointing up, and you click on that, gives you some options, perhaps. No, it just, I don't see that. Huh. Oh, that's, that's advanced. <laughs> oh, there's Peter. I want to say hi to Peter. Huh. I can't chat to Peter either. Oh. Sucks. Well, right now they can only um, chat with oh, you. Here. Hold I see okay, I got it. Um, everyone publicly and privately, how about that? Yes. That's fine. There. Now, can everybody do it? There, I found yeah, it. Now we can do it. We can do yeah. it. Okay. There you go. Right. Okay, that. let's. Um, Good thing you were here. <laughs> that's what he's there for. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I am going to start so I can hand it off to our first couple of speakers and then we'll. Okay. Hello, I'm Robin Rep curator of Terra Incognita. So glad you could join us this evening. Hope everyone was able to log on easily. A little later this evening, you can use the chat function to ask questions of our panelists. Um, and I just want to say thank you right now to Jake, who has volunteered to help us with those questions. So if everyone could click on the mute button, it's down in the lower left-hand corner on mine. It might be different on yours. But, um, it helps because um, uh, there is that extra background noise. Okay, well, let's get, let's get the Terra Incognita reception started with Evelyn Alou, our Assistant Director of OCA. Evelyn, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. I hope everyone can hear me. Have I, am I unmuted? Can we hear? Yes. All right, awesome. It's wonderful to see all of you tonight, and I, I, it's fun scanning through and seeing that you don't have to wear a mask, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> Let me just say that I would like to welcome all the husband and wife artists represented in Terra Incognita. It's a fantastic exhibition. So if you'll give me a minute, I'm going to share some images with you, but I need to make sure I do this correctly. So I'm gonna go here. Excuse me if I don't do it right. There. Okay. Do I need to scan up, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I'm going to try to do this. Did, it, did I do it right? No? Uh, huh? Yeah. Go here. Yeah. That's what I did, but it wasn't, didn't do anything. It says, okay, it says only the host can share in this okay, meeting. So share. You Robin, you need to share the images for me i believe or or make me double in a host or change me into the host okay or, here or I enable go. screen sharing for everybody yeah what's that okay yeah that would do it too so what do i do you don't have to do anything for the moment okay now what do we do uh, now she's screen sharing <laughs> so what do i do can I get rid of the OK host? Can yes, share this one? Let's try. OK, here we go. And go to screen, start broadcast. OK, and then we're going to go to this will stop other screen sharing. OK, yes. Yes. Yep. And now swipe up. Now swipe up. And then, here we go. And move on. There you go. Now, ah. now we got it. All right. Everybody can see me or hear me, I hope. Our physical gallery is located at 117 North Sycamore Street in Santa Ana. We welcome you to the gallery with private appointments to see Terra Incognita using safety protocols, including wearing a mask. 
you could request a re an appointment at info.oka at gmail.com. Terra Incognita is on view through October 24th, 2020. I'm going to tell you a little about, bit about some of the things that are going to be going on at the gallery. Crises mode. Crises mode is an open call juried by Lucia Alubumi Momo, who's an assistant cur curator at Berkeley Art Museum. Um, this is an open call for any artist in any media, and the deadline to enter is coming up on October 15th. Now we have Vision 2020. Vision 2020 presents the work of three artists working in three distinct mediums, painting, assemblage, and fashion design. And yet there is a mysterious affinity between them. Annie Clavel paints science-inspired abstractions. Dame Zandra Rhodes, DBE, designs avant-garde fashions. And Jeffrey Frisch creates three-dimensional assemblages that seem to have sailed in from a parallel universe. All right, next we have a world within worlds. This will be exhibited on January 2nd through 30th of 2021. Artist Geraldine Newworth. And this is going to be a fun one, and this is called Car Culture. It's an open call, juried by Brian Barcina, assistant curator at MOCA. I sure hope that you'll be able to attend or enter some of these exhibits, and here, hope to see you there. And back to Robin. So now I have to go. Screen broadcast. I did, but I'm not back on myself. Robin doesn't know she's muted. Robin, unmute yourself. Robin, yourself. you're muted. Start broadcast. <laughs> Has she got it? Yeah, I got it. Okay, I unmuted myself. That helps, right? Okay. Whoops. Wait, Evelyn. Wait. I'm going. Are you there, Evelyn? I got to take you off. There. Okay. Go click on that. <laughs> All right, we're back. Thanks. Um, all right. Well, thank you, Evelyn. You're welcome. Appreciate that. And um, a welcome to those that just joined. Great for you to come in and join with us. Um, oh, if you aren't aware of it, we have a catalog for Terra Incognita, and that is designed by Dolly Holbita. And it's available at the gallery or at amazon.com. So we have photographed the gallery using a 360 degree camera and created a walkthrough tour for you. We posted the link at Facebook today and it will, and it will be at um, oka.org, our website pretty soon. So you can link to this online 360 uh, degree tour and look around on your own sometime. Uh, it it's pretty easy. You just use your mouse and click and grab. You can go left, right, up, down, you can see the ceiling if you want to, or the floor. It's a complete 360 degree tour. Um, but right now, I'll just take you through a quick tour uh, together. We'll just go through the gallery. And um, what I thought would be nice is if we could listen to some music while we did that, um, because two of our artists that are in the show, jo Joe Forkin and uh, Eric Stoner, are musicians and they have a, a new album out. Um, they're in a group called Alpha Mule and the album Something in the Water and the name of this song is Floating Omens. So I'm going to take you to the, uh, the hosting site for the three-dimensional tour right now and I'll attempt to turn on the music at the same time. Let's see if I can do that. That's asking a lot, right? Okay, here we go. Let's go to Kula. Okay. Oh, I better share the screen for a starter, right? <laughs> uh, it's a lot to remember. Let's see. Got to share the screen. <sighs> Got to open the tour first. Hold on. Get the 
use the tour. Now, we're going to share the screen. Let's see. Can you see the front of Oka right now or not? Yes, shaking their heads. Oh, you're shaking your heads. Oh, good. Okay, so that's, a, down. that's, that's the a first end. step. Okay. All right. Only we were good at doing all this stuff, right? And let's see. It was right at the top. Oh, it was? Yeah. Oops, it's right at the top. No. Oh, I can't seem to bring the music up for some reason. It wants to go to my phone. I don't, oh, here it is. Wow. Okay, can you see it, Bob? What's the name of it? Oh, huh? oh, there it is. Okay. That's what I said. It was right at the top. Yeah, it was right at the top. Okay. Oh. All right.
thank you to our musicians. We have so much talent. And I invite everyone to please come see the show. Um, this is just a brief tour just to get you. Um, yeah, anybody can do this. You can turn the screen around and you can do it yourself. So. And it's right now it's posted on Facebook and it's posted, um, it's, a, it's on Facebook. And I can, I'll, I can send you the link. If you email me, I can send you the link and go there directly, so. All right, so thank you. And let's see what's up next. What are we doing? Let's see, is Rob here? Rob is here. Right there he is. There. So Rob, you better unmute yourself. Hi, let's Jeff see. and Lori, Joe. Yeah, I see the- uh, Crystal. Jeffrey and Victoria just joined. Hi, Rob. There's, there's hey. some more people. Okay, here comes a few more people. Hey, Jeff. Welcome to people that just joined. Both of you, Jeffs. Um, okay. All right. So, um, all three Jeffs. Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Here's our director of exhibitions, the center of all this, Rob <laughs> Mintz. Thank you, Rob. Hi. Uh, Hi. Before we introduce the artists and, uh, before I make a few uh, very brief comments about their work, I want to say a few words uh, uh, about the history of Oka, but mainly uh, pay tribute to its patron saint, George Herms, who was a uh, professor at Cal State University Fullerton. And he had a group of students in the graduate art department who were complaining that they had no place to show because in those days, the museums didn't show emerging artists nor did the galleries, unlike today when the galleries are always on the prowl for the latest talent, you know, and going to these uh, MFA exhibitions. But back then it wasn't so. So he, he suggested that they start their own gallery, and they did. And it's Oka. They named it Oka, and they created bylaws that have held it together all these years. It's quite amazing. And, uh, but something about George Herms, when I learned about all this, for years, uh, one of the treasures of my um, art book collection is this book called The Art of Assemblage from the Museum of Modern Art by uh, William Seitz. And I was able to ask George about this. And uh, he maintained a lifelong relationship with, with Seitz. And he was the youngest artist in 1960 in this book. It basically made him famous. And he suddenly found himself in the company of uh, Picasso and uh, de Kooning, Man Ray, and all these other great artists who worked in assemblage, which was still considered kind of radical and daring in 1960. But now, when you think about it, it's like the dominant medium. So George was ahead of the curve then. And uh, uh, so I always like to uh, mention Oka's patron saint which is another element that connects Oka to the history of art, as well as being, uh, you know, a player in the alternative uh, art, sp the alternative space movement, which is getting more and more critical attention. Uh, most of the alternative spaces have gone by the wayside or been absorbed by larger organizations. So the classic example is PS1 in New York which was absorbed by the Museum of Modern Art. So it's no longer an artist-run uh, art organization. So Oka is one of the few left uh, that's just fiercely independent and run by and for artists, but not limited uh, you know, by a parochial uh, view of art. It's always been international and historical. So with that, I think we should move on to the um, artists exhibiting in the show. Yes? Okay. All right. Uh, who do I, who starts first? Who should I mention first or just? Uh, well, we said Stephanie, uh, but she's up on a mountaintop. And Stephanie, oh, maybe, yes. did you get an internet connection? Eric? Oh. No, she didn't. I just, I received word today that she is out of cell phone service, or at least not enough to be able to um, uh, be part of the meeting tonight. So okay. uh, she well, sends her wishes, and I, I will most definitely 
do my best to speak on her behalf. Okay. All right. Well, I uh, will. Uh, well, th these are Stephanie's so, pieces right here. Um, so still read the description. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Rob, you could still read yeah. your description. Uh, uh, Robin asked me to uh, write a few words about the artists for her catalog. And uh, it was kind of inspiring to do it. I'm, I'm happy with, with what I came up with. But uh, Stephanie seeks the unknown territory with the innocent eyes of an awestruck pilgrim. Perhaps here we can worship as we wish and become stewards of the land. I kind of like this um, innocent eye that she brings to the landscape, uh, to the uh, unknown territory. And then uh, Eric Stoner, follow logically, yes, um, because they're a partner, you know, they're an example of this uh, artist couple concept. Uh, Eric Stoner seamlessly joins Botticelli with Jurassic Park, a fever dream teeming with references to art history, a painting definitely of its time. Everything is permitted. So this this work is truly over the top and, and in very much with, you know, the uh, trend toward uh, uh, pop surrealism and so forth. I mean, uh, it's um, um, very much a part of a contemporary tr trend toward work that's influenced by um, entertainment and comic books and film and so forth. So uh, who's next on your uh, list there, Robin? Well, why don't we just pause and let Eric uh, talk a little oh, bit yes. about his work right now. How about that? Yeah, and then we'll go on to uh, hey, the Lori. Yes. Please. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'll, I know I'll take a short time here because I want to include Stephanie in the conversation, but uh, um, Steph and I have known each other for 25 years, but been uh, been together as a couple for seven years and literally from within months of us uh, just making our connection, we started traveling all over the American West. Uh, we've got a beautiful little camper van that we're able to take lots of places and I it's the work that we come up with I would say it's a collaboration in the sense that they're both inspired from a lot of these travels I think I get more into the history because I have a lot of family history in the American West but we both when we go to these places it's just a different it's just a, it's a shared experience but a, a different thing you know where I we go to natural history museums. We go to the most beautiful spots we can find. Um, we're just immerse ourselves in it, but most of my work comes after I come back. Uh, either that or I'm sitting there playing music in the campground. And then, uh, you know, a lot of my ideas start with music and then I kind of, it's like I start with the soundtrack first, I guess. But, uh, you know, to sit here and watch her do these things and actually have pictures and, and references of the same places within my work and within hers, it's a real nice, um, we complement each other, I think, really well. And even seeing the room divided like we have, it's we, we sort of joke, it's like the line between sanity and insanity <laughs> because I tend to go a little over the top on these things. They're pretty uh, they're pretty outrageous. And um, well, Which is which, Eric? Which is which? Yeah, I think you're the insane one, no? <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Most definitely, <laughs> I guess That's you could say. Um, but you know, it, it just, it, it's a lot, it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun to see how the experiences sort of filter both through our, um, through our mediums differently. And I don't know if you can see close up in here or not, but uh, there, I, you know, I even have pictures that we've taken on our trips. I have pictures of each of us in these things. She has paintings of some of the landscapes that I reference and use in mine. Um, I think mine are a little more, uh, you know, obviously I have the narrative going for me in these, where hers are just really observational uh, sort of representations of, of the beauty of these places. Mine get into the history, uh, good, bad, and different. Um, I, I, my, I have a lot, I have a very rich family line that comes from Utah, and I've been spending time there my whole life. And my dad, when I was really young, would make it a point to take us to a lot of the areas out there in the parks and uh, Zion and Arches and you know Moab and all these areas. You know, back to when I was a toddler. So these places are pretty deeply ingrained in me, as well as the family history and the stories that I would learn from my grandmother. And she was an artist. And my first attempts at making art were basically copying her her work of the paintings of these places and hearing the stories. And uh, 
so it's just come out in a different way. I, you know, I just started tackling this subject a few years ago and uh, it was, it was an interesting thing to go back and look what my original inspiration was. And like I said, it was from those early trips to the parks. I, I became very obsessed with extinction. I think that's where the dinosaur motif comes from. Uh, and I just sort of threw everybody and everything into these narratives as far as referencing the things, referencing some religious history in my family. Um, and just as this sort of cycles of extinction where these people are sort of running around and they're very animated to me. I, I'd say some of my biggest influences go back to the animation of Ray Harryhausen and some of those fantastic things. So when I see a lot of movement in these things, they move like that. I've always been a fan of Hieronymus Bosch and some of those psychedelic visions and and just, I guess a lot of things going on in these at once. Um, and uh, you can you can kind of see in the landscape in the one that's on the screen, you can, and you can look right above it to the same landscape that Stephanie has painted, and that's in Zion National Park. So I think that's where the collaborative thread comes into it. You know, I think I just go a little bit more, um, you know, personal narrative and lean towards those fantastic <laughs> visions of those artists that have inspired me. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Just realized we don't have the full screen, right? Eric, can I ask a question? Yeah, ask away. Um, oh, something I don't know, I don't think you said, but what's really interesting to me is that each one of these images, there. this is not photoshopped. This is each image cut out, hammered in with little nails, correct? Oh yeah, yeah, everything is cut out um, down to the sculptural elements in the foreground. Which I can actually thank Lori. I think I consulted her initially on the medium, <laughs> which is Magic Sculpt, which she's actually given me advice on some different mediums now, which I'll look into. But uh, yeah, Lori, <laughs> I, I love the fact that I'm in the show with Lori because I love Lori. And, oh, and I, 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 I consulted her on a lot of this stuff early on when I first started it because of her use of mixed media. And, and even in my earlier work prior to this, I think she was one of the first references I made to an artist who was a friend of mine where I took some of the work I photographed of hers and collaged it into a, a whole other giant monster that was marauding over a <laughs> Peter Bruegel painting in a landscape somewhere. And um, so a lot of the, there's a lot of personal things like that that go into the details of these uh, that I really love. I, you know, How you can see it. that stealing. Oh, shit. Yeah, it's no, stealing. I, I'm just saying, I think it's really important that people understand, you know, in this age yeah. of digital paintings and Photoshop, that these are not, this is hardcore old school, cutting everything out and carpenter style, hammering in those little nails. And that's what makes it such a beautiful, like rich textured surface. Yeah, it's a fun tactile. This is actually a detail because the piece is pretty big, but- um, Love that, you know, love this that. Is, this is a, it, you know, this is interesting because I use a lot of, there's a lot of musical reference in these as well. So I use a lot of vintage album covers. So, you know, I have Tommy Wynette down there you know, she's the mother earth where the flowers pouring out of her. And I believe the the young girl holding the skulls from a corrosion of conformity album, which is sort of a hardcore metal band. The devil is, it's an album I had since 1983 of, from an Iron Maiden album cover of, uh, and you know, I, I, I just, I just love putting the actual materials in it because it gives it a nice feel and it helps me sort of work within certain scale. I, I'm sort of bound to the material and it creates interesting tension here and there, but, uh, you know, it's 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 like I could, I feel like a painter in a way, but I have infinite access to uh, content where I can just change narratives. Like, oh, I really never know how these things are going to turn out sometimes until they're actually done. But um, you know, I rearrange and arrange and put apart and take apart. But it, I have flat files and books and, and shelves and everything full of pictures that I just pull and whatever works, I just let it be an intuitive process and just go and just go with it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. You know, and I just like burying a little information in there and little bits of content and I collect materials from clients and pictures I've shot and it's just sort of a, it's just a, a, a fun mix of, you know, the woodworking and the sculpture and it's just really engaging and I actually really just enjoy the heck out of it. It's a lot of fun for me and, and this, this body of work in particular with the subject, it's, it's just been a lot of fun. They're crazy. They're ridiculous. They're completely over the top, but it engages me on such a such a wonderful creative level that I that I, I just get lost in them and I just I just really thoroughly enjoy the process and um, you know I honestly I feel like the relationship with Stephanie has really facilitated this and the fact that she, just her being an artist I think she understands just the time that goes into these and she's a 
unbelievably supportive of uh, the time uh, and, and she's really amused by him, which is a good thing. I always try to push it a little further just to get a laugh out of her or myself in the end because uh, I, I hope people see the comedy in these at some point because they're pretty, they're pretty darn funny, I think. That's so, great, Eric. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank you, yeah, thank you for the time to let me speak. Um, and thank thanks you. for inviting me to the show as well. I really appreciate it. This has been a really cool thing. And despite the COVID, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm really glad I got to put these up in a, in a room and see them together. So it's been a really great experience, especially with Stephanie's work and to see to be a part of this show has been really, really awesome. And I really appreciate the invite. So I just You're want to- Welcome, that. Eric. It, it was supposed to be a fun show with uh, five couples that were friends and enjoyed art. <laughs> well, we, we have until October. Maybe we'll all be able to get together at some point. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Well, yep, we will, hopefully. Okay. Thank you very much for the time. All right, Rob, back to you for an intro for Lori. Unclick. Yeah, I know it's hard. Uh, Laura Hassel's work, I've always found it to be unbelievably strange. Uh, <laughs> but I, my comment is that I think she mingles the biological with the mineral. And, and in this one, you know, I see an insectoid circulatory system suggesting that despite advances in medical science, the ultimate unknown, terra incognita, is inside us, another reminder of our mortality. Um, perhaps artist couples can conquer their fears together. Um, so I'm sure she, so who's, who is she with? I, I can never get that straight. Let's see. I'm, uh, with, I'm with Jeff Gillette. Oh, Jeff Gillette, yeah. yeah. So I'm sure these frighten him. <laughs> but uh, okay, well, Lori, what do you say? Well, I think mean, that's really interesting. And I really loved your description in the catalog, by the way. And um, I do have to say that Jeff and I, conceptually, we are kind of linked. Although um, he, and, and it's, it's kind of a bit of romantic nihilism on my part, but I think it's much more nihilistic on his part. So he would like to be at the precipice of human demise, of everything just convulsing into this cascading, um, end game towards extinction, whereas I prefer to think of the world, the earth, without humans. So this is a post-human extinction environment that I am sort of playing around with, I guess. However, obviously I can't let go of all the nostalgia I have for our species and the human brain, which is the most creative and destructive force on the planet. Um, and so these are a little bit like um, fairy tales from post-human extin extinction times. And I think they have now for me become reliquaries or memento mori, if you will. Um, maybe things that were preserved or, or were um, trying to be understood by whatever is able to live at the top of the food chain after we step out of the way. And insects are probably I'm going to be at the top of the food chain in some ways, right? It's always been said that cockroaches will uh, survive no matter what other species fails and goes extinct. So um, anyway, so <laughs> that's sort of my take on it. So Jeff and I, we kind of have this thing. He's just pre-extinction. I'm post-extinction. I like to think of the world without us screwing everything up. Too late. <laughs> he says it's too late. Um, so the, and the last image was more about um, those little pieces are becoming almost insectoids. So Robert, yes, that was very appropriate what you said. Yeah, they do seem like insects to me. I also have a real fondness for bones on many levels on one level they are, you know, it's always getting down to the bones of the truth. I mean, it's like when everything else is gone and decayed, you have the bones left and that is the essence of any situation, right? Um, they're also um, oracles. They tell us about our past and, um, you know, in a few millennia to come, the past may be discovered about us and about other creatures from who knows what could be aliens coming down. I'm a huge fan of sci-fi, grew up on it. So, um, 
Yeah, and then on another take, these images that you're seeing right now, um, these are more hybrid creatures, I guess, and I, I never quite know how I feel about them. I have this yearn as a sculptor to do semi-representational things, um, and I love animals. I love everything that comes from nature, um, and so I like to combine different things that you wouldn't normally like, um, you know, a bunny and a rock. So the piece on the left is like sort of what would it be like if, if actually rock became more of a, a living material, something that generated life. I love geology in all its forms. I don't know if there's a sculptor alive that, that wouldn't love geology. And then the images on the right, you know, um, the one in the middle is kind of a, a, com a combination of um, a horse, deer, and seahorse. And the one on the right is just sort of this, like sort of celebration, I guess, celebration and memoriam to um, a rabbit, <laughs> really. <laughs> um, but in everything that I do, it is a bit of a reliquary. There is a nod to mortality and death. And I know I overuse skulls, but the older I get, the more I grapple with my own issues of mortality and um, loss and those sort of things. And of course the loss on the most grand scale is loss of our planet, of our, um, you know, all of the just fantastical and amazing species, the variety, it's just mind blowing um, that our planet supports. So that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you, Lori. Uh, let's see, somebody had a question, Julie. Sure, Julie. Where's Julie? Well, we'll come back. Oh, I have, I have a few questions, I guess. Um, how large are they? So if you go uh, back to the first slide, um, the yep. fossil wall, those are all can mostly go, small. Yeah. Uh, can I go back to the wall? Yes. I just have to figure out how to do it. <laughs> so this, like the piece you're looking at on the right is probably about, I want to say maybe 10 by 10 around that inches. So these, these are smaller pieces. And then of course, if you look at that, which is in the center of the, the wall, right above the spine wand, um, if you look at that, then you can see from there how, how big the pieces are from there. And then if you go to the next slide, those are larger pieces. Next slide. Oh, oh sorry, from one direction. Hey, Last slide, yeah. No, next, next. Next one. Am I on the right slide? No. No. Nope. Next one. There. So the one on the left is a pedestal piece, so that one's in the round. And that one's, I'm gonna say, about a foot high by, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm sorry, I don't have the measurements right in front of me, but I wanna say it's about a foot high by probably about a foot wide. Um, in the right hand grouping with the two pieces, the one on the left is about uh, probably a little over three feet or almost to four feet high. Um, so you can look at, you can gauge that about the width and same thing on the right piece. That one's about three feet high, maybe a little less. Great. I have a question. Are the pieces available to purchase? Yes. Everything you show. It's just about everything. There's some that are not, that are on loan. Everything, everything except there's one just little patch on the wall of fossils that is, um, just it's not really a piece it's just sort of a, a little experiment that i threw up there but everything's available for sale yes <laughs> and if you go to info.occca at gmail.com and shoot us a message we can accommodate uh, actually i just saw an email flash up on my phone that two pieces have sold while we're speaking um, wow. you can actually purchase online at your convenience you don't have to come in we have wow. a site at uh, oka.org. So, but if you email me, I can tell you how to do that. So, 
That's right. great. Are they, which ones were they? It feels like QVC or something, doesn't it? I know. I'm like, oh, oh, these are going fast. <laughs> Email me now. Wow. Okay, wow. yeah. That's exciting. Well, yes, they are available. Yes, thank you. And then um, I see a comment from Victoria. Amazing work, as usual. Very wow. compelling. From well, really I must nice. say something. Um, I must yeah. say, Victoria, the way that we met, we were put in a show together, and I was never so honored in my life. Um, I had already had a picture of her work from an Art in America article, by the way, Ooh. in my sketchbook. And I, I just adored her. And then I was like, oh, my God, I've really made it now. I'm showing with Victoria Reynolds. Okay. Sorry, <laughs> Jeffrey. I didn't know you then as much, but Victoria was like my heart throb, my art crush. And oh. so it's really exciting always when I can be in a show with, with um, artists that I admire and I admire everybody in the show. I really, I really feel fortunate. This is a great show. Thank you for having us. Oh, it. we're so happy to have you. It's so much fun. And I know the last time, three years ago, Lori and Jeff were in a show with Jane Zabo and myself. We had 2,800 people came to see the show. The Pacific Symphony performed during our show. That was so much fun. I thought we're going to do that again and have a lot of fun. Who <laughs> oh, no, knew we were going to have the COVID? Still fun. So, yeah, still fun. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Well, I wanted to comment that uh, Oka has an upcoming open call for art. That we'd be honored if uh, if Laurie submitted work for it. It's called the Anthropocene Epiphany. You know, yeah, every every four syllable word deserves another four syllable word. Yeah, evidently. <clears throat> this is a you know, all the themes that you're articulating are 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 so contemporary uh and uh so important to the art scene, especially in Europe now. This idea of uh you know nature as an ongoing catastrophe and uh, hybrids of uh animal, vegetable and mineral and uh the uh, extinction and so forth. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to hear how you articulate this work. And I can see why the best ideas come from the artists, but this is really on the, uh, um, you know, at the forefront of new developments. In a few years, we're not gonna be able to escape these themes in art, you know? So uh, I, I hope that uh, you'll uh, enter the Anthropocene epiphany, you know? You, you'll like it. It's the interesting yeah, word. Yeah. And so, forth. That. yeah. so that, that's coming up eventually. Um, but then now it's on to Jeff Gillette, right? Yes. Yes, Jeff Gillette. I, I have one thing to say uh, about, about this piece, just for the benefit of, of those that, you know, might not be um, as well versed in these matters. But um, uh, isn't it fair to say that it's a post-earthquake depiction uh, of uh, a vision of Duchamp's nude, this time descending a pile of rubble. So, I mean, this is brilliant, the way that the nude descending a staircase has been integrated into this, uh, you know, fear that we all have of the uh, collapsed uh, freeway overpass. Um, and so I asked the question, does the fracturing of the picture plane in early modernism foretell our urban dystopia. Um, but uh, I, I just mentioned that that it does refer to Duchamp's nude descending a staircase, if, oh, yeah. if you didn't know that. But so Jeff Gillette, what do you say? Uh, I was just playing around experimental. I mean, it's all fractured like cubism would be or post yeah. whatever he was doing. But this is, um, this is a piece I, I was I was shown at Bergamo Station at the very beginning of my career, and I had two galleries at the same location. One, I did a bunch of stuff that was fun and easy, like this one, and the other one, which was Copro Nason, which I would do the darker stuff, the slums, that was hard. These things would be fun and easy, and I'd take, you know, I just sometimes I'd finish these in a weekend. The other ones, I would spend weeks on them. These ones sold like hotcakes, and the other ones just trickled, even though they were the same price. I, I just couldn't figure it out, but whatever. 
but uh, uh, dystopia, worst case scenario seems to be my theme. I think it, it stems from me spending a lot of time by myself my whole life. Um, <clears throat> when I was in the Peace Corps in the late 80s, I, I took a couple books of philosophy, <laughs> smoked a lot of dope and read, and I hit this cul-de-sac of despair horror called Schopenhauer. And he just kind of addressed the world as we're just bigger insects, that's it. And we're just doomed for despair and destruction and stuff. And it just kind of sunk into me, but I still am a romanticist. I still have hope and everything, but lately that's waning. But that's been kind of a theme I've put in there. We're well, actually sapiens, not giant insects. No. What do you say? Say again? Robin, uh, Robin no. chastised me for commenting. Sorry. No, you... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Dave, I want to hear. <laughs> Go ahead. I said we're actually sapiens, not giant insects, but there's not <laughs> much difference. <laughs> Are you sure about that? <laughs> well, we're, we're way more powerful at this point. But... Not for long. <laughs> it's our world still until we completely wipe it out. Insects will rule. <laughs> so I was doing a bunch of slumscapes because when I was in a Peace Corps and then since then I traveled to India and I always find myself in the slums. And what I find what's what's really freaky that's happening contemporarily is when I paint slums, I don't put people in. I'll stick cartoon characters often Mickey Mouse, that's kind of who I've gravitated. This is an older painting, so I was kind of experimenting with other stuff. But in my slum paintings, there's no people. I mean, once, once I'll put someone kind of secondary, I don't want them to take control of the picture plane and the content. I want to look at the architecture. I want to look at how people make architecture out of debris and you know, discarded materials. Well, and in a way, I'm thinking that's almost post-human because you choose not to put people in it. But that's what I'm thinking right now with this clamped down quarantine that's happening in India. You know, they got, yeah. they got what, over a billion people there and they shut the whole country down because 300 people died. I mean, that, I don't want to get political, but it's crazy. And the idea of everyone inside these little hovels sweating being miserable it's is horrible. my paintings i don't have people you don't see the people out we've there. been inside of those by the way we have actually been inside of many and it's not pretty I mean, that, these little boxes there there's maybe up to 12 people and it's a big square it's it's not even the size of a um, container it's, it's barely the size of a tent yeah right but anyway just I try not to get in despair. I, I am enamored with the ingenuity of the architects. Yeah, you, it, it would be uh, easy to look at it as a picturesque poverty, but but you can't look at it that way. It's too horrifying. <laughs> like, There's something wrong. Yeah. yeah. Well, the the thing that I notice between poverty and in an affluent country like ours and poverty in India and the, to the small extent we saw in China is people are more accepting of their fate. Maybe it's the religion over there or maybe it's just, it's been steeped in history that the distribution of wealth over there has never caught on to be equitable, mostly because there's too many goddamn people. But anyway, here it's just, I think poverty in the United States, I've done a couple slum paintings and they're, and they're just, it's here, it's just fucking ugly. I, I can't take it. Over there, I find it as beautiful, but maybe that's cultural elitism or I mean, Julie Lee has a question about why cartoon figures are over, over the shanties in your work. Why are they over the shanties? Instead like of behind or inside? Yeah. Maybe that's your exit. 
they're above it. It's that's our connection. So we're we are outside of this. We're Thank outside God. of it, yeah. Unless you go downtown LA and get mugged like I did. But anyway, <laughs> we are outside of it. Yeah, definitely. I feel awful now. All right. And um, anything else, Jeff? Any more questions? Um, if anyone has questions, right? Um, I'm, I'm done. That's cool. Okay. All right. Let's see. Victoria. Oh, so Rob? Yeah. Victoria next. So. Well, uh, yeah. Um, Ah, uh, uh, yes. Um, I also found these works to be kind of frightening. <laughs> they they reminded me of the the uh, uh, Gothic uh, no the the Indian uh, god Kali, the all devouring, and uh, but um, so my comment in the catalog is that uh, Victoria Reynolds' work hints at the primitive fear one may experience venturing into Terra and Vida. But um, I probably should have done more research. What, what, what do you say about your work, Victoria? Oh, gosh. Um, I'd say that it's an indulgence of mine and hopefully other people to enjoy their own fleshly reality for as long as it lasts, which won't be long, even though we think it will. It could end at any moment. And I, you know, part of it, I'm sure you, you can hear echoing the whole Protestant thing where life is good right now and we might even have some excess laid upon the table like some corpse or a motley crew of, of corpses and birds and all this stuff. But but it's gonna end and so we better be careful and we better be good sometimes. But in general, I, I think I'd more like address this kind of flip flop between, we are suspicious of beauty, we're suspicious of our own senses and uh, we're suspicious of, of delving into this, this material world. Um, and we think that we, our heads must be in the clouds instead of down here with all these molecules and chemicals and cells and blood flying everywhere. And, and we'll never know the end of the, you know, the end of the mystery. Uh, maybe when we die, we'll catch a glimpse right before we wink out. I don't know. I mean, we all have these varying theories, but in general, I, I, I find our inner network beautiful and sensual and and like an inner landscape like I've had dreams of, of entering into my own throat and exploring the landscapes there I think a lot of people have had those dreams and that's terra incognita I'd say you know those lucid dreams I remember having lucid dreams of going into my own throat and brain and and throat area with it dripping like a nice little post nasal drip in the background and, and so, yeah, this, I loved what, what you said early on about the Terra Incognita being our, you know, it's in our head. I mean, that's the unknown, that's the uncharted, and that's where we all reside, and that's where we all experience all this crap from anyway. So I really love that, how, how you spoke about that, the, the, you know the the uncharted and that's that's the final frontier really for me too i wish i could be there more often or, or be there in a you know maybe a better state of mind sometimes <laughs> you know so that's i don't know I, I think my art is partly about that and if you're interested um i don't know uh here is a i don't know if you can show this or not but i'm holding up a painting that i'm working on right now am i visible or yeah can't oh am i oh cool okay i'm visible so here's here's the, the latest and I, I don't know about jeffrey but i know for myself i don't know really how to have fun and so 
even after this show just went up and, and I got a solo show up at Burt Green Fine Art in Chicago and I don't know how to have fun. And so I had to get to work on something new. And I'd say that this this one is it it kind of is a really nice succinct statement of what I do with the other works is uh you know, there's all this there's kind of like a fleshly skin over this kind of ornate cartouche type thing. So this is a more for formal presentation perhaps of what's happening in a lot of the framed works. That's, yeah, I guess that's all I'd say to keep it relatively, you know, not indulgent. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Victoria. I enjoyed thank that. You. I enjoyed hearing that a lot. Oh. I mean, oh, beautiful. Let's have to save that. Gee whiz, well, thanks. Woo-hoo, it looks like Jeffrey stuff. Well, as soon as, they, as soon as they're ready for it. There, there's a piece of blinky right there. <laughs> I mean, we have meat going back between us for a long time now. And it, before Jeffrey and I got to know each other very well, he was really interested in my wheat, meat work, so he checked out a book on meat called the Meat Handbook. And he shortly found an image of St. Luke found in a piece of meat and wrote a whole article about it in Art Issues. And mm -hmm. Yeah, so our, our foundation goes way back in terms of carnal desire, no, <laughs> carnal interests. <laughs> okay, your turn. Well, yeah, he's uh, Okay. Rob, you well, wanna? Um, um, my comment was that Jeffrey Valens turns Americana on its head. His goofy celebration of the tasty, if dim-witted yard bird, may kill your appetite for KFC. The artist is an archivist of new world aberrations. And he's been at this a long time. You know, uh, his catalogs are still in, in demand, you know, collector's items. So that's how I, I know, know his work. But... Um, uh, I'm, I've been curious what he might say about it. Uh, am I ready to go? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, what I wanted to say for this show, I was trying to think of like where uh, Vicky and I intersect, and uh, usually there's there's not a, not a lot of places exactly where our work intersects. But there's just one one place which is uh, meat, and, you know. And <laughs> I don't I don't do a lot of meat work, but but you know this whole chicken piece that was done uh, in the 1970s obviously uh, has meat in it, and and uh, this this last year was the. 40th anniversary of the Blinky piece. So there's there was a couple big shows and so forth. And uh, there's been uh, like uh, four versions of the of the book, you know, four uh, editions. Right. And, and the, the uh, first one was black and white, and then it kind of got colorized, and then it got a little bit better. Uh, and then for this last one, I thought, you know, I I have the greatest meat painter right here, so I asked Vicky if, if she could do uh, a cover for for the book, uh, which was it was a slide before this one, so. Uh, oh, slide before this one. Yeah, okay, that's uh, where that's where we intersect. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh. There it is. Yeah, Vicky did that painting, which is which is the cover of the book now so I think that's just about the first time that we did did a collaborative piece although uh, I'm not sure if you if you have an image of it but but Vicki and myself and Jeff Gillette we all did a collaborative piece too which is sort of like the it's a Hiroshima piece and you know it's like has this land you know landscape is totally destroyed and then it has uh you know like a billboard with with the chicken on it with blinky on it so that's a another place where we where we uh, intersect 
Wait, that's in the show, right, Jeffrey? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. That was a good piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I thought it was fun to, you know, to have pieces with Vicky and pieces with, with Jeff. And I wish I could I could do one with you, Lori, do a, like a reliquary. We'll do it. We'll do it. We're going to do it, boy. Yeah. yeah. I love this piece you've got up right now. I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna just grab some random thing. We stopped on the collaboration piece during the tour, but you might not have read that it said collaboration uh, the three of you. This was yeah, I found this, yeah, this is gonna be uh, like a reliquary piece. This is just the, like the framework, but you sort of get get the idea. So any questions? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's so much in this piece, Jeffrey. There's so much. I, yeah. I love decoding it all. What do you, uh, oh, Jeff wants to know what you call the gobbler thing that looks like a ball sack. It's like, ball, it's like <laughs> yeah. Well, the balls under his chin. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you, 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 you wonder why so, they name a male chicken a cock, and you can, you can, you can <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Wait, I got a question. Blinky was not male, she was female, correct? That's what I believe, yes. Okay, but no, but there was no way to ascertain that fact from her living corpse that was in the grocery store for consumption. There was no way to tell if she was male or female. Well, you know, uh, there is some confusion about that. Uh, because usually when, when you buy a piece of meat, it's usually a hen, but but I'm not sure about that. Uh, you know, what do they right? What, what, what do they do with all the roosters? You know what I mean? Why would they waste all the roosters too? Yeah. So so maybe it's both. So maybe maybe uh, uh, Blinky could be male or female, and 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 I and I think that's. That's good to 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 not know, you know, because then you have both sides. Then you have the ball sack, and then you have the hand. You know, so. They kill the roosters when they're a day old. Oh, uh, yeah, is that what they do? That's Most old. of them. Oh God. There's, well, there's whole books about sexing chickens too, about like like being able to tell which gender. Oh. Any, anywhere on the spectrum, a chicken is very, very young, like a little bitty chicken. And I guess if you really think about that stuff, it's it's very, very sad and, and frightening. You know, what we what we do with with animals, how we how we treat them. Well, Richard says that's that a subject for another night. But we do it with cattle as well as chickens and everything yeah. else. Right, right. Yeah, we don't think yeah. much about their feelings. Right. Yeah, it, and and I really, I mean, I don't think animals are that that different from us. I mean, I, I, I think they have, they have they have feelings. I mean, they can they can hurt, they can be sad, all those things. But we don't want to admit that. We want to think, oh, they really don't feel anything, and they don't know what's going on. But I, I really think they do. I think we treat them like plants. Yeah, I do too. We treat them like plants. But they taste so good. <laughs> I said that. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> thank you so much, Jeffrey. Right. Really appreciate that. Really. Who's next on the chopping block? <laughs> <laughs> Crystal. Crystal. You know, I was impressed when I saw this work. Kind of surprised, but it it gives a uh, counterbalance, uh, an emotional tone because it's so expansive and open and has uh, you know lift to it. And uh, um, so the, the balloons drift over the unknown land beyond the reach of the exhibition's more somber notes. So that was my little comment on that. But um, I'm curious to see what, what she would say as well. Crystal? Are you unmuted? Um, I, I like to talk about the process to begin with. Sure. I'm a graphic designer, uh, and I used to design exhibition for museums. 
so for on that note, the, everything I have to do for work is according to clients. Uh, if our uh, office receives a project, uh, it's about civil war, um, which um, my office in Washington, D.C., uh, way back then was known for doing the type of exhibition. Uh, whether we like it or not, designers have to deliver. And we do everything clients want us to do. Uh, I remember one very fun project for me was to do a botanic garden for the state capitol. We had a life plan exhibition. And that was probably one of my favorite projects as a designer, realizing, oh my God, I 100% agree with my client, even though there was a lot of convincing. So when I get to create work for the exhibition, I tended to uh, not think like a graphic designer. I would do any wishful thinking. Uh, there is no one in my office say, say, you cannot use color pink, you cannot use color orange, you cannot do this, you cannot do this. I get into the complete freedom. Uh, all these images, most of them are uh, images taken from uh, trips and Joe and I go to many trips together over the years. Um, and many of them based on cell phone photo or very low quality digital camera that my father left me uh, way back then. It was a first generation uh, camera. Um, so a lot of images like this, um, I, my wishful thinking is I wish the world is a less cluttered place. So for example, like this, uh, there probably original photo would be like 10 people's cell phone in, uh, in, this cap in this image composition or so. So my job is to take them out to make it look cleaner. <laughs> the desire wanted to organize the composition and then I personally enjoy making things that are um, easy to access. And uh, so that sh shows up in my work. Well, thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Well, now it's on to Joe for Cam. Hello, everyone. Hi. I, I really like your use of the grid in, in this work. Uh, you know, that's an enduring structure in modernism. That looks like a Mondrian in the background. But uh, uh, the, uh, my comment was that uh, 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 in Joe Forcan's shifting cityscapes, not even the mythic glory of the modernist grid celebrated by Rosalind Krauss is safe from sudden dissolution. The solidity of stone, steel, and glass melts away. Uh, but, and thinking of this one, uh, the, cities, the city's denizens believe they inhabit a separate realm of color and movement, but they cannot escape the grid matrix because it exists within them. Uh, but it, the, uh, the enduring power of the grid, especially in depictions of the urban landscape, is, is uh, invigorating to see. So painterly, I, I, I like it. So, yeah, uh, when I first uh, moved to Santa Ana, I came here in uh, 2002 to take a, a teaching job at Cal State Fullerton teaching painting. And I, I uh, got a painting studio in the Spurgeon building in downtown Santa Ana. And I hadn't really done much landscape painting at that point. Um, but I started, I was working on my figurative work. And, and um, eventually, I was just so intrigued by the, the light hitting the buildings. I had studied color theory in graduate school. I had gone to Delaware, all the way to Delaware from Arizona to study color. And um, so eventually, I just put away the figurative work and turned my easel out the window. And I painted about 70 paintings and drawings out that window over a couple of years. And um, what I really noticed over time was that the buildings were just the structures that the light existed on and um, the, the different um, inherent colors and textures of the, of the forms 
shifted because of what the light was doing to it. And um, I, I really enjoyed having to look. And, and so it really wasn't about the buildings. Um, the buildings became the structure that, that, um, that sort of the light uh, manifested itself on and the color shifted. And so you could really track relationships. And, and I think one of the things, you know, I've done a lot of political work. I'm working on a crazy uh, 45 foot painting of the Kennedy assassination right now, uh, which is a totally different ball game. But what I really love about doing work like this is that I get to really look. It's not, you know, if you're painting a harbor to paint a harbor because you know people like harbors, um, then you're you're goal oriented in this way. Um, that's that's uh, I don't know. It, it, it's not interesting to me. But when I'm what I really love about landscape painting is I'm just really trying to enjoy my sense of looking and trying to capture that. And so it's less about the kind of information that's in the image and the act of looking is, is really what I'm trying to get at. And um, so uh, the, the, all the paintings that are in the show, there was a source painting that I did from life. So these, um, some of them are smaller. The, the largest painting in the show, the source painting was also huge. I did it out the window of the studio. And so it's a, it's a four foot plain, plain air. It's a, a four foot observational painting. And this one was, I don't know, a foot wide or whatever. And the, the painting, this painting is twice as big. So what I started to do with the grid was, um, I would uh, grid off the painting with string, the original painting. And then I would look at the square that presented itself and try to just see it as a single color and sort of build it from that and then um, find the purest color I could and then sort of uh, really uh, is another way of looking at how I was looking when I was painting. But it's also about, you know, the history of painting and, and just the, the love of the materiality and all of that. So, um, and, and, you know, I love color. I love uh, nature and, and just uh, one of my, pleasures is really looking like at the looking at the world because it, you know it's such a delight to see the beauty of, of light and color and and you can really um, enjoy it uh, its complexity when you're you're dealing with situations like this because there's so many things going on and the cities actually provide you a, a different kind of situation mm -hmm. because of these big mm -hmm. Uh, these monumental shapes um, give you a lot more, um, you can really track the relationships, the shifting relationships, foreground, background, um, morning, afternoon, summer, winter, all of those things. That's something that I was really surprised when I did all those paintings from the, the uh, Spurgeon building when I first got here was, you know, initially I, I couldn't tell the difference between morning light, afternoon light, June light, December light, in terms of angles and, and colors and relationships. And, and that stuff got more, um, I don't know, just more interesting and richer the more I sort of in, engaged in it. Yeah, so they're paintings about perception. That's Very great. much so, yeah. That, that comes through beautifully. Thank you. Um, do we have other pictures? And, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is the view. This is the view out the studio that I initially had, and I I painted those. Um, that's the back of these um, buildings on uh, Main Street and Fourth in Santa Ana. So you know, most of these paintings are right around the corner from Oka. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was the view out the window, and I, I painted this a whole a whole bunch of times. And then this is a composite uh, of a bunch of smaller paintings that I did. Um, that I kind of pieced together and expanded in the studio. And so working with those big shapes and then kind of dissecting that a bit um, and uh, playing around with the, with the relationships is, is pretty fun, so. All right. Well, thank you. Uh-oh, now it's me. Oh, gosh. <laughs>
Uh, I haven't had time to think about my own work. Let's see. Um, this is Let's rob you. They rob you start. Maybe you can get me going. <laughs> yeah. No. The uh, uh, Robin Rep's classic black and white vistas of water and sky have the ineluctable allure of the Hudson Valley School, but in a cooler West Coast key. And and since writing that, I've also focused on the uh, existential aspect of Robin's work, where you see, maybe there's a slide here, the isolated figure in this enormous landscape. And so I'm seeing that as a statement of the, yeah, of the human condition. Um, you know, it has philosophical implications. <clears throat> so that's wrong. Uh, yeah, I wish we were there right now. That's a great comment, Jeff. <laughs> um, I've always really liked the figure in the landscape. And I think coming from that Berkeley background where so many of the painters painted the figure in the landscape, it, it turns up in my work a lot. Most of my work has been uh, with a social commentary slant from, I think, from the beginning when I started making the protest posters and 1970 when I was at Berkeley um, and the, the workers at Home Depot or, um, you know, this type of uh, the protest march pictures, uh, like the one that was on the billboard recently. Um, I've always enjoyed the trying to document our time using the black and white infrared photography. I used to do the film infrared, which is really hard, but I, uh, in the last Oh, at least 15 years. I've been doing the um, digital infrared, which has uh, been a lot more successful. It's actually easier. This um, picture was taken on an island that uh, I have I moved to in 1974. Lived there for a year, and uh, last year we went back was our 58th trip. So it's a place that I do love. But during this time, I've seen the the reef be destroyed, unfortunately, mostly by tourism, um, too many people. The people depend on the reef to survive. So part of this is still, even though it's a document, it's a landscape, figure in the landscape, it has an underlying meaning with the um, being an environmental portrait. It's about the uh, loss of the reef and what's happening there. And the other, uh, picture, let's see, where was the other one back? Yeah, the last tree, this is a flooded area, um, is again, an environmental portrait and a commentary. Uh, there was a island named Rapa Nui that um, at one time was covered with trees. It doesn't have any trees now. Uh, well, at one point it didn't have any trees because the people chopped down every single tree. They knew it would destroy the population and it would be horrible, but they couldn't stop chopping down the trees till there was only one tree left. And when I saw this scene, it reminded me of that, of the original Rapa Nui, which is called Easter Island now. But in their, uh, in their stories, in their old stories, uh, they chopped down every single tree for firewood and to build with and whatever they needed, even though they knew it would destroy them. And it kind of reminds me of now with the climate, we can't seem to stop even though we know it's going to be our demise and we're, it's going to destroy the planet, we can't seem to stop. Mm -hmm. so, and this flooded area is a, a, a refuge. Now with the infrared photography, um, someone at the gallery last night asked me, oh, that's snow across the back. Where, where is that where there's snow all the way across the horizon line? I said, actually, it's, it's not snow, but in infrared photography, uh, the wavelengths of light, if it's green, it looks white. And if it's water or sky, it turns black because there is no infrared light. When there's green, there's a tremendous amount of infrared light. Plus clouds have a lot of infrared light. So it's a little, in this infrared photography, there is a little flip on the, um, on the values. They're not exactly true. You, you can see it here. There's some snow in Tahiti. Yeah, some of my pictures of Tahiti, it looks like there's snow and people have said that can't be Tahiti, there's no snow in Tahiti. But, um, it's just the flip of the color, so. Are those waves? The, yeah, uh, out on the, the reef in Tahiti is about a mile and a half off 
of the shore. That's why the lagoon is calm. The waves are breaking back there um, on the back of the, of the reef. So. And that is my husband, who there is my model in this picture with his creepy looking mask. So. <laughs> so. Okay. I was snorkeling. He was snorkeling. And I think I will turn it over to him right now. He's a much better speaker than me. Hey, can I just say something, Robin? Yes. Oh, I just wanted to say, I mean, your experience in these remote islands is so fascinating to me. And it's weird. I didn't think to bring this up to you before. But Jeffrey and Victoria have been to, um, what is that? What's that island you guys go to all the time? Oh, Haiti. Oh, it's, it's Palau? Palau. Oh, Palau. That's great. Yeah. yeah, that's a great diving spot. Yeah. Tom, and Tom yeah. Or whatever, right? And, and that's part of Jeffrey's work. So it's like your visits to those isolated islands. I mean, all of that rich experience you had there has filled some of your work. And Jeffrey has had the same experience. I mean, he met the king of Tonga, right? So I, mean, just, I think it's fascinating. You guys maybe didn't know that about each other. I asked you to go back to the tour. Wow, I didn't know uh, Jeffrey had been and uh, was going to pop. Oh, wow. Yeah, Huaini is a very remote um, island. And luckily, it still has, in the 50 years since I started going there, it still has only a population of 5,000 people. It hasn't changed. No, it does. But the cruise ships have, is what's oh, taking no. a lot of the food. You know, the people start, instead of just harvesting the food, they give it to the cruise ships. Okay. Well, Bob, I'll let Bob talk. Hello. Bob. Rob, I need you to read your description. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm. I'm happy. Happy to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the. Uh, uh, I, I was relieved when Bob endorsed this commentary. He said that this was good. That uh, Robert Rep's rugged, rugged geological layers give us the unknown land as brute matter, an inhospitable terrain, remote from human understanding. Resisting comprehension, like the world described by Quentin Mayasu in After Finitude. Uh, Mayasu is a contemporary French philosopher, very young, but he's taken over the, the world of philosophy by storm, and philosophers, you know, twice his age are paying homage to him. And uh, he describes uh, very systematically this world outside of ourselves, um, which he calls. Uh, the great outdoors, which is a refreshing idea, but uh, but it's uh, far removed from the safe anthropomorphic uh, world of existential humanism. Uh, Doesn't he say we can't get there though? We can't get outside because we can only see. Um, we can't see in itself. We ha we can only see using our brain, we can't step outside and see it as somebody else. It, you know what I mean? That's how he, kind of how I understood what he's saying. It's there, but it's very difficult, if not impossible, to get outside. And if we do, it'll be face to face. I don't know, that's confusing, but the book's very tough. I, I yeah. powered through it. It's very tough reading. So my work, um, I've always been uh, interested in, in, in the earth. I'm very earthbound. I spent two hours in the garden today. I love to garden and I love to swim in the ocean. Um, I'm very grounded in the earth, um, always have been. And I've done a lot of hiking in Yosemite and in Montana. And I've taken slides uh, over that time. And I can not hike like that any longer, but I still have the slides. So I thought it would be a project to go back and look at the slides and saw, try and dry, draw something from them that was completely different than what they look like. And that's what these images are. They're 
they're drawn from photographs and the photographs themselves look nothing like this image here. Um, it's uh, just trying to present an idea really. Um, when Robin told me that we were going to be in a couple's show, I had to do something for crying out loud. So, uh, Well, the work, the work is complimentary. Uh, the more I've thought about it, the more I can see how your work really does uh, uh, relate to Robin's work as well. You know, well, you know, uh, we were each there for all of the photographs in the show. And, uh, we travel together clearly and, and uh, all of her photographs that are in the show, I was with her when they were taken and all of these photographs. Uh, well, not all of them, but most of them she was with me. She couldn't climb to the top of Yosemite Falls or the top of Half Dome uh, even 25, 30 years ago, but I had to go there without her. But uh, anyway, yeah, we... Uh, so it's a collaboration, no doubt, and we toss things back and forth. And uh, I ask her if something looks decent, and if she says yes, then I proceed. And if she says, oh my god, what were you thinking? And then I let that one go. <laughs> anyway, I got to go. The earth might end tonight. I want to walk over and look at the ocean. <laughs> I love the idea that you told me today that we were present for all of that work together. I love that idea. And it really fits. It's a Can wonderful I? thought when you think about that, that we, there were shared experiences and that our work came out of that. So. I wish we could show the, the image of the, uh, the collaborative piece that we did. Uh, it's, it's quite impressive. It's, it was done with photos that I took and, 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 and that she took and we mashed them all together and, and made an image of uh, Yosemite Falls. It's not real at all, but it kind of looks real. It's really quite beautiful. We'll have to see the show then. Can I make the comment? Can I make yeah, you could see it in the I, I'm really mouthy. I seem to always be making comments. She's a teacher. What can I say? Because I'm, I'm having so much fun seeing all of you guys talk about your work and I'm chatting to each one of you about your work. It's just fun. Anyway, I mean, What's, it's amazing to me, and I love that you shared that you guys were both present at the same locales m making work and photographing work, and it's so distinct, and, and it's so, God, I mean, Bob, I can see like almost it's a scientific exploration where you are going into this microcosm of a, a scene and extracting almost like on a molecular level a part of that bigger, bigger um, scene. And then like with Robin, it's so psychological for me. It's so philosophical and it's so about isolation and, and things that actually I love. I don't see that as a negative. So, I mean, it's just very fascinating. So I'm really glad that you shared that. Oh, that it was, you, you, you both pulled that inspiration imagery from the same place. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll shut up. <laughs> All right. Well, let's. I think we don't have any more pictures on there. I'm a Gemini. <laughs> there we are. Well, that was really great. Um, okay. Now let's see. Oh, well. Any other questions? Do we have any other questions on the chat? We have lots of nice com comments from everybody. Lots of thankful ones. Um, let's see, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Frisch, our executive director, has a few words for us. So unmute, Jeffrey. Unmute your, there you go. Now, is that? Yeah, thanks. Cool. Yeah, well, um, I just want to thank everybody. But before I get into that, um, I want to kind of circle back to a comment that was made earlier when you uh, realized a couple of pieces of soul that you said it was something like uh, QVC and I, I thought that was kind of interesting and kind of reminded me real quickly of a story I heard about um, on cable television there was a couple of signals a C-SPAN signal and the home shopping network 
signal got crossed up. And uh, before I knew it, I bought a congressman. So um, that's humor. Okay, so anyway, um, just really, really quickly, just want to thank Stephanie and Eric and Lori and Jeff and Victoria and Jeffrey and Crystal and Joe and Robin and Robert for a really good show, a really good exhibition. And um, it's really, really a strong one. I really recommend everybody, if you can, make an appointment, check in on um, info.oka at gmail.com, make an appointment, and go see the show in person. <coughs> The uh, next thing probably to mention is uh, in terms of exhibitions that have been mentioned before, Crisis Mode was coming up. The juror for that is Lucia Olumbuni Momo, and she's the uh, assistant curator at the uh, Berkeley Art Museum. And of course, we mentioned uh, Car Culture is coming up, and that's uh, Brian Barsena, who's the assistant curator at MOCA. The uh, Crisis Mode deadline to, supply, uh, to apply is October 15th. And for car culture, it's December 30th. So um, just like to encourage everybody to check out both those exhibits. And then uh, you can also, if you feel like it, volunteer to become a friend of OCA. And I would also encourage any of the artists out there to see about joining us at OCA as an artist member. So with that, um, I'll turn it back to Robin. Okay, well, thank you, Jeff. Um, let's see. Let's have our toast. Anyone have a drink? This is a party. Let's have a drink. Where's is Sohila signed on? She was gonna. She is. Where's Sohila? I just saw her. Turn off your. She's uh, right under the thing there. Turn on your mic, Sohila. And. But what's interesting is to see everybody making the same gesture in all of yeah. these squares. You know, so that's kind of the thing to see. Yeah. Okay. Hey, okay, there's Beth. Hey, Beth. Hey, oh Beth. Oh my gosh. Cheers. Cheers. And Lynn. Oh my gosh. And Lynn. Hi guys. Uh, we're, we're visiting from Santa Cruz. Yeah. We're all the way down there. Thank you for signing in from Santa Cruz. Oh, that's yeah. Cool. Here we are. Well, okay. Rob, you're leading the toast. Okay, congratulations to all the artists for the beautiful exhibition. It's really beautiful. It was at the gallery in, uh, uh, in uh, installation time, and I really enjoy every little piece that is in the show. So hopefully we will have some, uh, you know, private tours will be available. If anybody would love to take a tour in person. All right. Well, I'll drink to that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I wanted to um, thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, and I do look forward to meeting you at the gallery. Um, oh, I, he says I have to come back over here. <laughs> In person. We had a few appointments yesterday, actually. Um, but I wanted to personally thank um, all the artists who are in the show, all of our guest artists, and a big thank you to the artists of OCA. I don't know if you know, we're all volunteers that run OCA. Um, and so these people took time out from their own busy studio schedules to plan, promote, and install this exhibition, especially Jeffrey Fresh, Annie Clavel, Rob Vince, Rich Vaughn, John Ng, Evelyn Liu, Sohila Siadate, and Steven Anderson. I hope to see you again soon. So with that, I'll say good night. Thank you, everybody. You know, that's great. Thank, Thank you, Robin. Hi, Rob. Thank, Thank you, Rob. Good night. Hope to see you at the gallery. Thank you. Love you all. Bye. Bye. Thanks to all the artists. You were great. Thanks for making this special. Robin, oh, Robin so worked to really you. hard to make this happen, including this zooming thing and the 360 camera and everything. She was really busy. She always does. She's been always hard at work, all this stuff. Thank you so much, Robin. It was fun to learn the 360 camera, I think. It was fun. Not near as fun as having a thousand people would have been last night. But, yeah, you that's know. true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah. We'll get that. We'll have an in-person reception maybe by October if we're lucky. So. Hey, I think for my sister.
tell, are we keeping it for October now? Where's Gay? Did she already leave? I think I so. Think just set it up for 100. Yeah. Maybe in mid-September or October we can do it. Do it. So, we'll see. Hey, Carolyn. I just saw Carolyn Yarnell. Unless the bugs have taken over by then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Great yeah. show. Oh, it's show. Did you see it from the Look at look at Carolyn. She's so cute. I hope you'll get a chance to come to the gallery if you haven't been there. Um, just make an appointment and come. It's it looks so great. <laughs> it's really and good. Robin, I think there are many of the members who would be willing to let if they if the if they wanted to contact one of the members and the member would meet them and let them in. That's a possibility too. Yeah, that's great. I actually booked a few appointments today and I had already good. booked earlier this week so there are people that want to come when they're just there by themselves just for private appointments so right and it's a big place it's a 6300 square foot place with very high ceilings so um hi so um it's very airy you know it's very super airy and we have a, a designated walk through the gallery um we i we have a thermometer that you uh, just can get near and it it senses your temperature wow and, Plexiglass dividers. We did, I think we've done everything. Everything's no touch, so it's it's uh, it's about as safe as it can be. I hope. Is the thermometer an anal thermometer? Yes. <laughs> it it's on a tripod, and uh, you just you don't nobody has to even hold it. You just put your, your head up to it, and it beeps. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the thermometer is that way. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It shoots you in the forehead if you're over. Yeah. So. <laughs> So we've done everything we can, everything's no touch and that kind of thing. There's even hand sanitizer things around the gallery, no touch. And there's little uh, decals on the floor that say this way, this way, just keep people moving six apart. <laughs> so hard. Yes. Thank you. Well, thanks. She did. Yeah. Thanks. thanks so much, everybody. Thank and, uh, I'm thrilled. I'm getting like I'm getting messages that there's already money coming in at the Oka Network site. Cool. So, yeah, that's exciting. Uh, that's <laughs> well, I said if you really want these pieces, then you may pay for them and they'll be yours. So. <laughs> that's, how <you> <laughs> that's how you do it. Are they are they are they all right. Here we go. It's so great to see you, Beth and Lynn. Thanks for tuning in from Santa Cruz. So happy to be here. They're both artists. Beth is a painter and Lynn is a sculptor. There's still a lot of people here. Sculptor, sculptor painter kind of. Yeah. Great job, Robin. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. How are things up in Santa Cruz? Good? Oh, you know, same as everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, it's weird, weird world. What can we say? We we're putting in a lot of studio time. Yes, you know, yeah. that's what there is to do. Make art. Where else are you gonna go? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> we're. I'm grateful that our studios are away from our house. Yeah, in a different location, so we actually get to get in the car and drive somewhere. Go somewhere. That's great. So we'll see you soon. I hope. Okay. All right. Take care. Great nice to see you, Rob. Rob. Great to see your work. Face time. Face time. Yeah. Jeffrey, yeah. right. face time. I hope everyone will go to the uh, 360 yeah. tour. Right now. You can access it at uh, Facebook right now. We'll get it on the website too. So, Carolyn, is that you on the camel? All right, everyone. I'm out. <laughs> Bye, Eric. Tell Bye, Stephanie, you, we Robert. really missed her. I was looking forward to the broadcast from the top of the mountain. Darn it. Oh, yeah, well, we'll uh, we'll get back in there. And we'll hopefully yeah. we'll get a public opening at some point. That'd be nice. Yeah, I hope so too. Thank you again for everything, Robin. That's oh, great. thank you. Oh, see you later, man. Great, beautiful. Bye. 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 It's so great. I gotta get. How do I? Get it's great to see Victoria and Jeffrey in person. Vice oh, versa. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and a catalog writer, <laughs> <laughs> writers in person. You know, it, it'll be a lot more fun to see you in person now. You yeah. know, because we've done this. So I know. Yeah, you can take the tour at your own pace too. You know, the 360 tour. It's easy, I think. Yeah, yeah. The 360 tour is meant for you to do it yourself, and you know, use the mouse and it's move it around and all that stuff. Yeah, but, you need details though, so I don't know. I, I'm looking forward to when.
when the um, all the pictures are up on the website because details are important, I think. Yeah, you know, I want to, I have to figure a way to, like we did for the Oak at 40 show, everybody's work was on the website and you could click on it and buy it. So we have to figure out how to do that for this show. It would require a picture for every single piece of work. So that's, that's the thing. Um, it, it's a lot of data. We used an administrative site for that. So it was a little bit easier, um, but we'd have yeah. to get our webmaster uh, on board with that. We'll figure, yeah, that'll come. That'll, we'll that's get a big, out. big I project. Light. I've got to get some bit light back on here. So yeah. Robin, when you end this, that means that we can't keep talking any of No, we can keep talking. We can keep talking as long as we want here. Because I, mean, I, I wanna, I wanna um, get together with Vicki and Jeffrey for a little bit. Um, yeah, no, you guys can visit on the Zoom right now if you want to, even if everybody leaves. We yeah, I think I won't end the meeting. I think we'll- um, Okay, don't end the meeting if it's yeah. okay. Only, well, I don't know, is it being recorded? Maybe we don't want what we're saying recorded. Well, I can edit out anything past the <laughs> I wish I had a beer. Come on, I'll, I'll, Toria, I'll send you a different Zoom meeting thing, okay? Yeah, do that. She yeah. needs to learn her own Zoom for teaching in the fall, so we're going to give her yeah. a school one right now. Okay. I got to get some other people at Oka to do the Zoom thing, too, so, this you know. This thing is, is intense. This was great. Can I just say thank you, Rob? Robin, you must have been working your ass off. I don't know how you did all this. I, this has been great. great, great, great. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. When I was getting emails from Jeff's uh, collectors right up to about 15 minutes before we started, I was trying to yeah. and trying to get pressed. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, awesome. yeah. So we made it. We I made learned, it. I marketing at the Heidi Flight School of Marketing. <laughs> Nobody knows who Heidi Fleiss is anymore. Heidi Fleiss, that was a madam. I know who she is. Okay, she does. <laughs> yeah. So Jeff, uh, Jeff Gillette, do you have more of those uh, Banksy Mickey things? Yeah, I got to look and see what I have. And then I can okay. do whatever is available. We can send them through that. Okay. Email me um, pictures and prices, uh, or it would be nice if it was the same. If, yeah, they're you know. all the same. Well, I, except the gray ones. The gray ones are slightly different. Okay. Because so I sold Robin, the two. You mentioned you sold four pieces. Um, do we get to know who, who's... Who no, Jeff, uh, Jeff's, the two Banksy pieces. The, the, um, oh, somebody that lives in Long Beach? Hmm. How about, um, did Lori sell something? I thought you said she did. Long no, um... This is Jeff's, Jeff's pieces. Okay. Two pieces. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Such a whore. Heidi Fleiss. <laughs> Heidi Fleiss. Heidi Fleiss so, took me in the back room and showed me how it worked. I thought two more pieces sold of somebody's. I thought there were four pieces sold and, and they were somebody else's. And I was hoping that it was anybody else I'll have to, I have to go to the Oak Oak site and verify that but he sent me an email and said that he did send the oh, money I have to here verify. comes Tuck Riley back hello <laughs> hey Tuck Riley oh, hi we saw an empty room are any of my people still here I'm a friend of my people are gone I had some people yeah, well, they didn't last long who's Tuck Riley I don't know I think I met Jeff one time I yeah, people, but uh, you know. I know your voice, Tuck. I know your voice. Oh, well, I, I had. Oh, you do? Because yeah, I, 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 I have vocal cord surgery. I don't know how you would. <laughs> I know your. I just know your voice. I know it. Thank you. And you have great things to say, so I know you by that. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I have to learn my, more about myself by listening to you. <laughs> is that is that thing to your left? Is that a bong? Oh, shut up. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> got a, got a, what does bong look like? Out of it. It's a yeah. base. Yeah, what is that? It's a big bong. The Waterford lamp. It's beautiful. Okay. Oh. <laughs> what the hell? Oh, okay. Matt heats it up. 
Well, you know where my husband's brain goes to. I've, I've had this for like, I don't know, 40 years at least. <laughs> <laughs> it, hasn't, and it, hasn't, it hasn't broken. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's hard to do. I take care of stuff. <laughs> where are you? Where are you chiming in from? Where are you from here? Seal Beach. What beach? Seal Beach. Oh, you're in Long Beach. Seal Beach. Seal Beach. Orange County. Orange yeah. County. Yeah. Not, I don't go to LA County ever. Well, <laughs> it's challenging, isn't it? Vicki and Jeffrey will tell you all about that because that's their stomping ground. But you know, guess what? They get to show at the Hammer Museum and all those fancy places. Well, I, no, I lived in I lived in La Cunada in Pasadena for a long, long time. So <laughs> but I've been an Orange County person since what, two thousand and five. And I love it here. I'm not leaving. Here's some comments that uh, have come up at the end that we didn't see. Um, Liz Goldner said, it's great, it's great to see, it's great to see everybody. This event's so refreshing. Um, I'll call soon. Um, did you see that? Did you guys see that? Oh no, it's private, I guess, privately. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Thank you, everyone. This was amazing. Um, fantastic show. Uh, here's one from somebody, Denise Scott. Is there a link where we can view the pieces for purchase? And great production. Good job. So a lot of nice, positive feedback, right? Well, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much. It was, I enjoyed every, every minute of it. Yes. Good great show. seeing you. Thank you for coming. Here's okay. Take care. They're okay. all so beautiful. Oh, there was a question for Jeff Gillette. What are the legalities of using known cartoon characters? Didn't oh. see that earlier. That's appropriation. The Supreme Court's ruled, uh, Jeff, haven't they ruled that it's uh, totally legal for uh, appropriation. Oh, take your mute. Take the mute off. Pretty sure I am doing. They, they get ripped off with hundreds of millions of dollars, and from me, they're they're losing one one millionth of that amount. So I don't think they care. Yeah, I, I go by fair use. Hopefully. Because you don't see anything they do with Mickey in a landfill. So I'm doing something that's original. I'm not stealing their shit. I'm juxtaposing it. I'm appropriating it. Isn't that the right word, Jeffrey Dallas? Yeah, appropriation. Mm -hmm. You're infiltrating Disneyland. Yeah, <laughs> intervening with their copyright stuff, I guess. I don't know. We'll see. It'll be their lawyers. It'll be... 16 of their highly paid $300,000 every six month lawyers against a teacher. Yeah, that's, that's pretty bad. <laughs> and you will win. <laughs> I think, Jeff, if your paintings were going for like millions of dollars, then somebody would try and sue you. But, you know, yeah. uh, otherwise it's like too small for them to worry about. Yeah, the two that sold were, I think, were 500 apiece. So I don't think, I think their lawyers are, have bigger fish to fry. But unless they want to be punitive. But then I would make it a, a, a artwork being sued. <laughs> that would be if you need a lawyer, let me know. <laughs> I am one. We used to be. You take care, guys. Thank you again. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Doc. Bye bye. Rob, thank you for doing such a great job and with your art historical notes of your insights and art. You're, You're welcome. always so good at that. Thank you, Robert. Good job. Appreciate it. All right. I, I'll sign off. And um, so if you guys want to stay and visit, that's fine. I won't end the meeting. I'll just leave the meeting. There's some way to do that. I don't know how to do it. But. Remember to turn your camera off on these things. It's a bunch of frat boys came up with this thing. Yeah. yeah. A bunch of frat boys developed this thing. That's why Zoom got in trouble because 
if you don't turn your camera off, oh. somewhere down here, it's, it can stay on even though you turn the program off. My FaceTime, I notice sometimes the camera's still on. I've noticed yeah. that. You gotta watch that. To but you that noise, watching sorority girls. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a big motivation to get it down right. That's funny. All right, I'll figure out how to leave somehow. Or we'll start a new one. You guys, you guys, we'll send you a link, okay, Jeffrey? Okay, do that. Yeah. All right, good night, everybody. All right, good night. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jeff and Jeff. <laughs> Take care. Hope, Bye -bye. hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, I hope so. Take care. I'll keep you updated. All right. Yeah. Take care. Good night. Love you all. Okay. Love you.